So the novelty detector, the locus ceruleus fires in bursts. And it fires when something unusual happens. And it can focus your attention. So as I'm speaking here, if someone in the back falls out of their chair and has a tray full of glass and it breaks and makes a loud noise, everyone is going to, what's that? That's your locus ceruleus. It's firing, saying, here, it's something to pay attention to. And then it gets to the cortex and you decide, is this something that's important or should I listen to Nichols talk some more? What do psychedelics do in the locus ceruleus? Well, they don't change its basic firing rate, but they enhance its burst firing. So they make it burst fire more intensely and longer for things that normally would not produce novelty. And I like to think that this is what happens when you look at a flower and you've seen millions, thousands, or hundreds of thousands of flowers in your life. Okay, it's a flower. But when a psychedelic activates the locus ceruleus, so it increases its burst firing, Wow, that's a flower. Oh, that is really cool. So that's kind of what I think the locus ceruleus could do. <clears throat> and the locus ceruleus and, and the raphe, both serotonin and norepinephrine, interact with the, this area in the apical dendrite. Serotonin are serotonin 2A receptors. And uh, for nep norepinephrine, they're alpha 2 receptors. And they share the same signaling pathway. They activate phospholipase C. So they both activate these cells. The VTA releases dopamine, <clears throat> and when you're dreaming, it still releases dopamine. One of the pathways I've left out is an acetylcholine pathway that comes from a, another brainstem uh, region that's responsible for REM sleep. But normally when you're sleeping in REM, the locus ceruleus is not firing, the raphe is not firing, the dopamine is firing here, and then this acetylcholine nucleus is firing. But with the psychedelic, these are not firing. It's like you're asleep, but you're awake because you're cortical cells have been stimulated. Now there's one other thing that happens, and I don't have it on here. The way the cortex is organized is these pyramidal cells are organized in columns, and they first discovered this in the visual cortex. So when a signal comes into one of these columns in the cortex, it sends out what are called collaterals, adjacent interneurons to adjacent columns, and it releases an inhibitory transmitter called GABA, gamma amino butyric acid. So it silences those and allows it to focus. So if there's an activity in the cortex, it silences its adjacent cortical uh, cell cells so that the activity is focused. Serotonin 2A receptors located on these GABA interneurons shut off the release of GABA so that now you have spread from one column to the next. You lose the focus in the cortex. So you can kind of imagine a synesthesia process. Instead of being focused very tightly, now the signal is spilling over to adjacent cortical areas. So overall, what we've done is we've probably affected the information that's getting through the thalamus and getting sent to the cortex. We've activated these cortical cells so they have enhanced gain, signal noise ratio. We've shut off the inhibitory cells between those cortical cells that normally would inhibit adjacent columns. We've turned the locus ceruleus and raphe into states that normally would look like dreaming, uh, raphe being shut off, but locus ceruleus being turned on and it normally would be off during dreaming, so it's activating these cells as well. And we're activating, the VTA is releasing more dopamine. So it really disturbed the overall architecture of normal states of consciousness. And that's a gross simplification. I'm an organic chemist, so <clears throat> that's the best I can do for today. <clears throat> Interestingly, Franz Vollenweider has done a lot of really cutting edge uh, uh, brain scanning, and he's really the world's top guy in this field. And I got this picture from him years ago, and thanks, Franz. I've used this picture a lot. Here's a resting state of the brain cutaway. And you can see this is the prefrontal cortex. And activation in this PET scanning represents redder areas. And you can see that after psilocybin, we have activation of the cortex, increased redness. So we're turning on the cortex. <clears throat> can you tell who that is? And this actually says Sasha on the little name tag here. <clears throat> so um, unlike my good friend Sasha, I can't do this at Purdue. Um, many, many people have volunteered to do this at Purdue, but I can't do it. <clears throat> so how do I study psychedelics? Okay, I can do this brain chemistry and receptor site stuff and all. How can we study them? <clears throat> it's a huge problem. And over, and over the years, <clears throat> I use lots of different techniques. In the background, we have a superfusion bath. 
We use condition avoidance response disruption when I was a graduate student. I used smooth muscles from dog uh, vascular strips, looked at mouse locomotor activity, cat limb flick, all these things. Rat drug discrimination, which we still use, radial ligand binding, we developed I-125 DUI as a radial ligand. Um, locomotor activity in rats, we still do that. Measurement of signals, we're working on computer models of uh, serotonin 2A receptors. All of that has led to drug discrimination is probably the best model for this work. <clears throat> and I'll explain to you how this works. These are operant chambers, and <clears throat> two sides are cut away, the front and the end are cut away. And so we put a rat in here. <clears throat> now in the wild, rats don't press levers. So the first thing we do is we teach the rat to press a lever. Now, I won't go into how we do that, but we teach a rat to press a lever. And after he picks up that technique, we then put him into a chamber with these two levers, right and left, and this pellet trough delivers a 50 milligram sucrose pellet. That's candy, sucrose, right? It's rat candy. <clears throat> so he gets rat candy whenever we feel like rewarding him. So let's say on Monday we give the rat LSD, we put him in the box, and we activate this right lever. It's hooked up to a micro switch. We don't turn the left one on. He wanders around the cage. He knows how to press the lever, so he starts pressing these. He presses the right lever, and he says, and he hears a click, and his rat candy drops down. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> he does it a couple times, and we take him out. <clears throat> the next day we put him in, we turn this lever off, we turn this one on, we just give him a placebo, 0.9% uh, sodium chloride and water. And now we turn this one on. He wanders around, checks out the levers. He presses this one, and he starts getting rat candies. <clears throat> we do that for two to three months, and eventually the rat reliably learns that if we give the rat LSD, he presses the right lever. If we give him placebo, he presses the left lever. And we alternate that, so half the rats are trained with LSD or drug on the left and half on the right, so we don't have any hand in this. <clears throat> on any given day, then, if we give the rat LSD and we put him in that box, he'll press this lever. And this is an, a really robust response. That rat will press 2,000 times in 15 minutes. The practical consequence of, of that is 2,000 rat candies were breaking us on our budget. <clears throat> So we raise the, the ratio up so the rat has to press this lever 50 times to get one of these reinforcement pellets. So it's trained on an FR50. It's called a fixed ratio 50. Presses 50 times on the correct lever, he gets a reinforcement. <clears throat> now the really neat thing about this assay is something called the third state hypothesis. And what that means is once you've trained the rat to respond on LSD, if you give him uh, amphetamine, cocaine, anything else, he doesn't respond on the LSD lever, he responds on the placebo lever. He only responds on the LSD lever if you give him something that he perceives as like LSD. So we develop a new analog, our new derivative, I don't want to use the word analog, right, Control, controlled substance analogs. <clears throat> we develop a new molecule. We wonder, we've done some receptor binding stuff, 10 or 5? 10. I could do this. <clears throat> So we put him in there, <clears throat> we give him the new drug, and what does he do? He presses the lever. <laughs> he says, I think you gave me LSD. And if it doesn't have the effect, then he presses the other lever. So basically, we have an assay where the rat says, I think you gave me LSD, or I don't think you gave me LSD. And that's as good as it gets in this preclinical model. But that's actually proven to be pretty useful for us. <clears throat> The reason being, if we look at this, what these are, are the ED50s for drug discrimination compared with LSD. So we have a ratio of the potency of these drugs compared with LSD in rat drug discrimination. And we've done the same thing in humans, taken the dose of LSD as set it as arbitrarily 100%, and then compared the potency of these other drugs. And what you see is, here's Ethlad, that's more potent than LSD in the rats. So it's 185 times more potent than LSD in rats. In humans, about 140, 40% more. 200, 100 something, 100, 100, 100. And what you see, they're not exactly the same, but in general, there's a trend. 2, 1, 9, 2, 6, 3, 3, 3, 2, 2, 6, 1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 8, 0, 4. So if you plot these out as a, as a plot, you'll get a linear correlation between potencies in drug discrimination and potencies in humans. So it gives us an indication of potency. We will occasionally get false positives. The, the rat will say, I think you gave me a psychedelic, when in fact we know it wasn't a psychedelic. But it doesn't seem to give us false negatives. 
So it tells us, the rat says, I think you gave me a psychedelic, and this is how potent I think it is. And that's pretty useful information. <clears throat> I wish we could go further. I was at a meeting uh, on MDMA years and years ago, it might have been at Stanford, and we had a panel, and Sasha and I and some other people on it, and after the talks, we were sitting in the panel and somebody from the audience raised their hand and said, well, you've talked about rats and enzymes and all this, but what about the spiritual aspects of MDMA? And no one wanted to handle that, and I leaned up to the microphone and said, well, my rats are atheists. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, that's what I have to do in a pharmacy school at a Midwestern university. <clears throat> so now I'd like to talk in the remaining seven or eight minutes. Why is the diethylamide of LSD so unique? <clears throat> You know, Albert Hoffman made 80-some analogs of LSD, and it was only the diethyl uh, that proved to have this activity. And we have a library, my technician has made a library of 20 or 25 lysergamides. None of them have the unique activity that LSD has. So we asked the question, why is that? What's, what is it about the diethyl group? Well, one hypothesis is that whatever the receptor it binds to looks like, it maybe have a specific place that the diethyl group binds. How could we test that? <clears throat> it took us about 10 years to complete these studies because we started with a bunch of different derivatives. But one way to test that is to lock the groups. So these groups here, this is an ethyl and this is an ethyl. So this is the diethyl amide group. And those ethyl groups can rotate and swing around and adopt a variety, an infinite variety of shapes. We thought, how can we lock it into some specific shapes to see? One way to do that is to incorporate these ethyl groups into a rigid four-membered ring. So this looks, you see, we have the two ethyl groups, we have the two ethyl groups. So what we've done is tied these two carbon atoms together with another carbon atom. So that's a rigid four-membered ring. It's called an azetidine. And these methyl groups that are attached that would represent the ends of these ethyl groups are either on the same side of that ring, which is called a cis-meso, or they're on opposite sides. And we have two isomers. We have an RR trans, and we have an SS trans. So we have three isomers of molecules that could have a four-membered ring with these two methyls. So here's, <clears throat> here's, what they, here's what they look like. Here's LSD from the front with the front ethyl group pointed down and the back ethyl group up, or the front ethyl group pointed up and the back ethyl group pointed down. And these are the corresponding dimethyl azetidines. And you can see the relative similarity. And if we look at them from the top, you see here's LSD with the ethyl groups in this orientation and switched with the ethyl groups in this orientation. And these are the two azetidines, the uh, SS trans and the RR trans. You can see the overall similarity. So we tested these both in our receptor binding and in rat drug discrimination. <clears throat> and sure enough, only one of these three isomers is active, and it's this one. So we know that when the LSD binds to the receptor, the ethyl groups are in that particular orientation. And in receptor modeling studies we've been doing recently, and I don't have a slide for that to show you because we don't have time, but we know that the receptor is evolved and has amino acid residues that just have a pocket that's the size of that diethyl group. So it just fits. So whether coincidence or whatever, the serotonin 2A receptor has evolved to have a pocket that when a lysergic acid derivative binds, the diethyl is the one that has optimal binding properties and activation properties. Peculiar presentiments indeed. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> now in the, the last part of this is <clears throat> I want to do an experiment. Can we bring the house lights up? Daniel Friedman, it's just enough so I can see hands. And turn the camera so we can film everybody. No, no, don't. <clears throat> Daniel Friedman was uh, one of the premier LSD researchers. Uh, he trained a lot of LSD researchers at the University of Chicago. He was the head of psychiatry at UCLA. And he did the early clinical studies with LSD. And he told me on many occasions, and he has this written in a book in 1984, talking about his subjects that were given LSD. What is striking is that the trip unfolds through an acute phase, about four hours, and a four to six hour second phase. During the second six hours, subjects fairly regularly report that they had been at the least self-centered and usually suspicious with ideas of reference or even paranoid convictions. Nobody has studied that. He's told me on many occasions, Dave, I think this is important. Now I want to do an experiment. If you're willing to do it, you don't have to. I would guess that we have a fair number of people in here who have taken LSD. If you're willing to participate in the experiment, we're not going to film you. 